If you have your Bible, we are going to be in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 14, verse 13 through 19. So again, that's Romans chapter 14, verse 13 through 19. God's word says this. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and I'm persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we humbly come before you in the name of your precious Son. And it's only through your Son we're able to come to you. And it's through your Son we are redeemed. We are a redeemed people. Us who have been given life by grace through faith, we are redeemed. We are sanctified. We are being sanctified. We are glorified and we are being glorified. And you have called us to holiness and also you have called the body to unity. You have called the body to walk in love. So my prayer um, this morning is that you may help us um, illuminate our minds and heart to this very passage that has relevance, especially in times like today. So speak to us this morning in Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. So several months ago, um, I watched a, a video on, a, not sure it was YouTube or Facebook or Twitter, one of those things, right? And um, the video, uh, it's a short clip, but the video showed a, a man building um, a pyramid using um, those red party cups, right? And um, it was pretty impressive. It was about 13, 15 feet or so. And you, could, and you know he put a lot of time and effort into that pyramid. But that video is about 13 seconds long. And what we see in that video is that he's climbing up the ladder to put the, maybe the, the last cup on top. And while he's doing that, the ladder begins to lean forward. He loses balance and he falls right into the pyramid right ouch um, not so much that he hurt himself but man all that work and that's it is done that little mistake um, just destroyed something right something that was pretty impressive and I often think that relationships are kind of like that our relationships begin with a common bond and value and it's pretty um, impressive and then one disagreement on a certain issue, and it's all gone, it's shattered, just like that. Um, this seems to be the case often in Christian circles today. We begin to grow in fellowship with each other because we have a common belief in Jesus Christ as Lord and Sa Savior. And then as we get to know each other deeply, we discover differences and so we argue and we have this verbal warfare that begins to go on and it begins to shatter everything, doesn't it? 
Now, because of human nature and because of our sin, it is impossible to agree on every single thing. It's just impossible. It's just not going to happen. As we see from our text this morning, however, Paul is going to allow even the church, Christians, believers, to have differences on certain issues, on secondary matters. For the Bible never calls the church to uniformity, but it has called the church to unity. Thus, God's main concern is not that we have different viewpoints on certain secondary theological issues or even on politics, but rather he is concerned on how we respond to the brother or sister in whom we differ. As the great Saint Augustine said, in essentials, unity, we have to agree on certain elements of theology, who Jesus is, his atonement, the very character of God, how we're saved, no question about that. But he also says, in non-essentials, liberty, there's freedom there. And here's the key, in all things, charity. In today's text, Paul is going to exhort specifically the Gentile Christians to walk in love in the midst of differences that they're having with their Jewish brothers and sisters. Um, so let's begin in verse um, 13. It says, Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Now, when you're studying your Bible, especially the epistles and especially Paul's letters, it's very, very important that you zero in on key words. And I could tell you, in every letter of Paul, a key word is always going to be therefore. When Paul uses the word therefore, don't miss it. Just don't say, oh, it's just a regular word. No, because when Paul uses therefore, he's drawing conclusions based upon his previous argument. And this argument is really made at the early top of chapter 14. So what does Paul argue? What is he saying in the beginning of chapter 14? Well, in verse 1, we see that he's calling the Gentiles, which is non-Jewish, the Gentile Christians, not to quarrel with believers with different opinions, but instead welcome them. Why? Because God welcomes them. Verse 3, he calls both groups, Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians, not to despise one another or pass judgment on them. Why? Because God has welcomed them. Verse 6, Paul says what matters most is not so much that secondary issue or that practice, but whether or not you're doing that for the good of God, for, the, for honoring God. The motive is at stake here. That's the issue. Verse 7 and 8, Paul says the Lord alone is our judge and we belong to him. Verse 10 to 11, Paul says we will all stand before God and give an account on what we're doing, what we're believing, and most importantly, on how we treat our brothers and sisters with different viewpoints. So in light of this literary context here, Paul gives several imperatives that's found in this message. And Paul's purpose here, his aim, his goal, is to bring unity among believers who hold to different views. And his ultimate desire is that in the midst of these differences, which are secondary in nature, each member is required to walk in love, although their brother may hold to a different view. Walking in love in the midst of that is the issue. So what does he say? Stop passing judgment on one another. Now I think it's important at this point to give you a bit of a historical context to help illuminate this passage. Here, um, Paul is addressing a church at Rome, which was a predominantly Gentile community, Gentile Christian community. And the reason this church is predominantly Gentile is because many of the Jews at this 
point of history have been expelled from Rome by the emperor and his name was Claudius. As a result, the Gentile community began to increase in numbers. Um, they began to dominate the church and also they began to form leadership there. So what happens? Well, over time, the Jews were, they were allowed back into Rome. But what happened? To their surprise, things have changed. In practice, how they practice the faith, and of course, leadership has changed to Gentiles. So, the Gentiles were under the conviction, the theological conviction, that they were free to eat what they wanted. And that they were no longer bound to the dietary laws that we, which we found in the Old Testament. In fact, as we're going to see here, Paul even agrees with them. The dietary laws was given to the nation of Israel at a particular time in history. It had its purpose, but that was all under the Old Covenant. In light of the arrival of Jesus and what he has done, and the fact that he has instituted the new covenant, those laws in which we found in the old covenant, in Exodus and Leviticus and the other books in which we find them, those laws are no longer universally binding upon Christians in the 21st century. Good, right? However, for the first century Jew at this time, it was hard for them to grasp this new idea. Why? Well, for many years, the dietary law was something that they considered good. It was valuable. Why? Because it was given to them by God. And they had to obey it, and they had no problems with it. It was embedded in their lifestyle. It was embedded in their culture. It was embedded in their teachings. It was passed down from generations to generations this was good and the purpose of it at that time at least was to make them a distinct people a peculiar people a, a holy people this was good some food was bad and we didn't eat it and we didn't associate ourselves with those who did so what we see here at this church in Rome is a collision of two distinct groups with two different views. The Gentiles are considered from Paul the stronger believer because they are living in Christian liberty. The Jewish Christians are considered the weaker brother because they are still bound to the Old Testament law. But who is Paul addressing here? Who is he addressing? Well, at least in this passage, he's addressing the stronger, the Gentiles. And what does he tell them? Stop judging your Jewish brothers for their religious convictions. Stop doing that. Now, to be clear, he's not talking about judging your brother when they're in sin. That's not the context here. When a brother and sister are in obvious sin, we're called in love and gentleness to point it out to them in the hopes that they will repent and confess their sins but that's not the context here he's not talking about uh, christians living in sin neither is the context here bad doctrine he's not talking about that because as we see all over scripture when someone comes into the church with false doctrine we're called to gently but boldly to correct them and to rebuke them if necessary. False doctrine isn't the issue here. The issue is here is things that are neither bad or things that are neither good. For example, watching TV. That's neither good, that's neither bad. Um, getting on social media. That's neither good nor it's neither bad. Um, wearing shorts and sandals to church, neither good, neither bad. I guess you have to ask which church, right? Um, but <laughs> theologically, we're allowed to do that, right? So Paul's clear command is this. 
stop judging them for their religious convictions and that we need to think hard before judging someone. Most importantly, we need to think hard before passing that judgment to someone else. Because oftentimes what happens? We have a judgment and what do we like to do? Pass it to this person and that person and this person, right? That's what we tend to do. And what Paul is saying, pause for a moment. Instead, decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. In other words, don't do something that would lead them to violate their conscience, which would then lead them to sin. In verse 5 of this chapter, Paul gives his assessment on whether certain days are better to worship God than others. All right, again, for many of the Jewish Christians, they believe that Saturday, that was their day. That day was considered holy. That was the Sabbath. And this is what, so there was debates between a Jewish Christian and a Gentile Christian. And here's what Paul says in this very book. Each one should be convinced in his own mind. Paul's argument is it doesn't matter which day you worship God. It doesn't matter what day the church assembles to praise God. It doesn't matter. What matters is, is what you're doing is, it, is your motive to please and honor God. That's the issue. The issue is the issue of the heart. Why are you doing it? So in light of that, the Jews believe that continuing in the dietary laws was pleasing to God. And for them not to continue in it is sinful. So what Paul is telling the Gentile Christian is don't do anything that will ignite them to violate their conscience. In other words, don't eat a cheeseburger in front of them and say, here, have some. Don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because it can hinder their walk with God. And Paul's point is very simple. Charity with whom you disagree with. So let's continue with what Paul is arguing here. And he says, I know and I'm persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for everyone who thinks is unclean. You catch that? For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in what? Walking in love. By what you eat, by what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So here, Paul again talking to the Gentile brothers. And he says, listen, bro, I'm in agreement with you. We're here. Theologically, we're here. There's no such thing as eating food that is unclean. That's done away with. And I'm glad, really, I'm glad that you are living in Christian liberty and freedom. Kudos to you. However, this does not mean that eating certain foods is okay for everyone else. And for the Jewish Christian, eating certain food was a violation to what God had called them to do. Thus, they should not violate their religious conviction. Therefore, Paul tells the Gentiles not to use their freedom in Christ, which is a good thing, but not to use it as a means to boast or as an instrument to cause your brother to grieve. In other words, do not exercise your freedom in a way that would disrupt Christian unity, but most importantly, do not exercise your freedom in a way that will hurt your brother. And what Paul finds most important is not our particular view on secondary issues, but how we treat one another. And as brothers and sisters, we are called to treat one another with love and compassion. And this often means that we become sensitive to this person's religious conviction Although we may think it's pretty crazy. And also, most importantly as well, 
we must empathize with those with whom we differ. So I'd like to share a story about um, two brothers in the Lord. Steve, um, he is a, a new member at church. And at the church, there is a more mature member. Let's call him Oliver. Oliver eventually becomes friends with Steve. Both of these men are from different cultural and ethnic background. However, they are, share a common bond in their love for Jesus. They begin to talk and even hang out outside of church. They soon realize that they share common beliefs and convictions. And after some time, both of these brothers begin to grow in brotherly affection towards one another. One day, Oliver invited Steve over to his house. He needed help assembling something at his home. And it was Steve's joy to help his brother out. And this would be the first time Steve came over to Oliver's home. After working outside together, Oliver invited Steve into his home. Immediately when Steve entered his home, he became disturbed by a particular historical portrait that he had hanging on a wall. A bit upset and disturbed, Steve asked Oliver, hey, why he had this historical portrait hanging on the wall. Oliver gently gives his explanation. Steve tells him why he is offended by it. Oliver gets upset now and now he's offended. They both exchange words with each other and Oliver finally says to Steve, listen, this is my house and if this portrait offends you, you can bounce. So Steve, so Steve, in anger and hurt, he leaves. Both brothers stop talking for a while. After some time, Oliver started to feel convicted by the Holy Spirit after he was reading the Word of God. He knew he needed to apologize for the hurtful words he said. He calls Steve's and he apologizes to him. He invites him over the following day. As soon as Steve enters the home, he notices that that portrait isn't there anymore. Immediately, Steve says to Oliver, listen, bro, you, you didn't need to take it down. You didn't need to do that. I mean, you're right, it's your home. And after doing a little bit more research and reading, I, I can understand better on why you had it up. I, I get it. And you know what? Bro, we can agree to disagree. Oliver said to Steve, I took it down not because I agree with you, although I better understand your view after also doing some research. But I, I didn't take it down because of that, but because my relationship with you is more important than that portrait. And I don't want anything to get in the way of us growing in unity and growing in love and advancing the gospel. Most importantly, I don't want to hurt you. Coming back to our text, Paul is telling the Gentile Christians to forego the eating of certain foods when you are in the presence of Jewish brothers. Why? Because we should not grieve our brother. And when we grieve our brother, according to Paul, according to God, you are no longer walking in love. Lack of empathy, not listening to one another, Pride in our own convictions and not caring for how someone feels is contrary to biblical love. And note what Paul says to the Gentiles, and he's saying that to many of us this morning. He says this, listen, you are destroying, it's hard, you are destroying the one in whom, get this, 
Christ died for. Whoa. That's hard language, isn't it? To destroy here means to bring about someone's spiritual ruin to such an extent that they even may abandon their faith. And what Paul is saying here is that a person's soul, a person made in the image of God is more important than those secondary issues that we feel so adamant about. Paul continues in verse 16. So, continue on his argument. Don't miss this now. So, do not let what you regard as good be spoken as evil. Living in Christian freedom or liberty is a good thing, is a blessing. And by freedom, I am speaking of the idea that Paul expresses in Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 when he writes, For freedom Christ has set us free. That is one of the, the great news of the gospel that Jesus Christ sets us free from the bondage of the law. This is a type of freedom in which we're no longer living under the Mosaic law, which includes ceremonial laws, judicial laws, and dietary laws. We're free from that. But it's not a license to sin, of course. This is a type of freedom that seeks to obey, God, to obey the commands of God, not as a means to earn salvation, but because I am saved and because I love God. This is a freedom that doesn't live by the slogan, I obey so I can be accepted but rather I obey because I am accepted. So Christian freedom from this theological framework is good. However, we can often use this blessing and turn it toxic. There's a lot of good things, blessings that are good, but we pollute them and one of that clear examples is sex. Now you're waking up, right? Sex is a good thing, right? It's something that God has blessed this world with, but he has also given us guidelines. Thus, sex is good under a particular context, right? In the context of marriage between a man and a woman. But what has happened we have misused the gift of sex. In the same way, many of us have misused the gift of liberty. And how, were, and how do we do it? And how were the Gentile Christians doing that? How were they misusing it? They were flaunting it. They were boasting in it. When we, and also they weren't considering their brothers and their sisters personal convictions. They were misusing it. As Grant Osborne says, the name of Christ is maligned by the spiritual ruin caused by the misuse of freedom on the part of the strong. What is good in itself can have terrible consequences if not used wisely. <laughs> the dissension and spiritual hurt it might cause would result in the church being revived by many. So the issue here is again misusing it. Misusing it. So let's contextualize this for just a moment. Let's just say, for example, you're wearing a, a particular gear, right? And you have the freedom in this country to wear what you want. And our Christian liberty we have the freedom um, to wear what we want. But what if wearing that particular gear in the context of 
brothers and sisters, and that's what the context here, brothers and sisters in the Lord. If wearing that particular gear, that brother or sister, some reason that you may not understand, finds it offensive, what Paul is saying, when you're in the midst of them, don't do it. And you may say, well, I don't care. It's a free country. I'm living in my Christian liberty. I could do what I want. I can say what I want. I could wear what I want. And you can't do nothing about it. Tough. Let me ask you a question. When you talk that way, and some of us talk that way, I see that type of verbiage on Facebook especially. When we talk that way, is that the Holy Spirit talking? Or is that the flesh talking? The question is this, are you caring about the image of God in that person? Do you care about your brothers and sister in whom Christ died? Remember, that person whom you're offending, you may not give a rips about them, but God does. So much so that he bled for them. He is precious in their sight. As Paul says in Corinthians, everything is permissible. You're allowed to do it. Yes, you are. I'm not going to argue that. But Paul also says not everything is helpful. Not everything is beneficial. And the question is, is that thing, whatever it may be, is it helpful in the context of Christian relationship? That's the question. Paul continues in verse 17. Hopefully you're following along. It says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy and the Holy Spirit. The issue of eating or drinking, or let's contextualize it again, the issues of our views of statues, our views of the president, these things, no question about it, are important conversations. I grant that. And we should have them because the world is asking it. And as a body, we need to give biblical answers, not fleshly answers, not answering according to our uh, political affiliation, but answering according to the Word of God. So these questions, these debates are important and we should be slow to speak, quick to listen, and understand one another. I grant that that's important. However, these issues are secondary to the main thing. These issues are not central. And that's the key. These issues are not central to the kingdom and of the gospel message. What's central to the eyes of Paul? as he is speaking under the influence of the Holy Spirit, as he's being inspired here, is righteousness. And we see that very early in the first five chapters, as Paul argues how everyone, no matter your economic background, your ethnic background, all of us fall, has fallen short of the glory of God. We all have offended a holy God. And we deserve the punishment of God. But the question is, how can we be made right before God? And Paul answers that question by faith in Jesus Christ alone. We are declared righteous. We are given a right standing before a holy God through an alien righteousness, through an imputed righteousness, not a righteousness of our own, but through the righteousness of Christ and by faith, we accept Christ's atoning work. And once we do that, we are immediately declared righteous. That's central. That is key 
in the message of the kingdom, in the message of the gospel. And he also mentions here peace. As believers, we have peace with God. We were once enemies of God, living in sin, but in due time, Christ came and brought us back into a loving relationship with God, whereby we now could come to Him. And He's no longer looking at us with wrath, but with joy. And then He says, He also mentions here is joy. And this is the product of righteousness. This is the product of having peace with God. And as Paul mentions here, this is all made possible by who? The third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit makes these supernatural benefits come to life. We must be about the kingdom. Yes, we talk about these cultural issues, these political issues. We have our opinion. But let that not drive us. Let that not drive the church. The kingdom and his message should be the driving factor. As we continue in verse 18 through 19, Paul says, Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Living in a way where the gospel and the kingdom is the foundation of your life and is the framework from which you operate and live your life is a life pleasing to God. When you consider the other person, especially your brother and sister of the Lord, when you empathize with people, especially a brother and a sister of the Lord, when you show charity with whom you disagree, especially a brother and sister of the Lord, when you're sensitive to the hurt, the pain, the trauma, and the pain of another, when you consider the marginalized and the oppressed, when you listen to the views of those who are ethnically and culturally different from you, you are living a gospel-centered life. You're living a life pleasing to God. And last time I checked, when I read my Bible, life is not about pleasing the flesh. Life is about bringing glory to God. As the Westminster Catechism, their first question, and this is one of the questions that I teach my girls, is, what is the chief end of man? That's the million dollar question. What is the purpose of man? Answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. The BSF Catechism. Question, what is the purpose of my life? And my girls know this by heart, they say, my purpose is to know God, to love Him, to enjoy Him, and glorify Him. This is a song. We sing it. When our lives is lived for the glory of God, when we make life about delighting in God and loving Him, it has, or it should, have radical implication in how we live our lives, especially among the body. When you are living your life for the glory of God, your needs, your wants, your personal convic conviction on certain issues is no longer the fuel of your existence. You say with Paul, my body is not my own, I was bought with a price. You say with Paul, whether I eat or whether I drink, I do all for the glory of God. Therefore, here's the conclusion now, I would choose not to offend my brother, my sister, although I may be right theologically, and maybe what I'm doing, or, or my particular opinion may be right, but it may not be sinful in and of itself, but because I love my brother, but most importantly, because I'm living for the glory of God, 
And because I love God and I want God to be pleased with me, I choose in my freedom, in my liberty, I'm choosing not to offend my brother. I'm choosing. No one's telling me to do it. I'm choosing not to tear him down and to hurt him. Verse 19, Paul says, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Our aim as we huddle back together in our Christian groups, in our Christian community, should be edification. It should be peace. It should be love. It should be unity. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, there will always be different opinions. Always will be that way until Jesus comes back. There always will be different opinions where, Christ, where Scripture does not give clear guidance. This was true in the time of the Christians living in the time of Paul in the first century. And it's still true for us living today. And what's interesting here is that the word pursue is a verb. It's action, which means making peace and building one another up takes intentionality. We can't just sit back and believe things are just going to mix well. No, we got to walk. We got to talk. We got to get together. It doesn't happen on its own. And this tells us something important, and that is making peace and building one another up is hard work. There's no question about that. However, as a body, as a people, it is worth it because Jesus died for the church and we must take steps in the right directions. And one of the first steps we should take is to be before the Lord in prayer, number one. And sometimes, and this is the hard thing, sometimes that second step is to do what Oliver did in our story, in our parable, and that is to call your brother or your sister and tell them you're sorry. You may not get it, you may not understand it, but you're sorry, and which means, by being sorry means you're gonna seek to understand them. Being sorry means you're gonna seek to um, do your research if necessary to understand their viewpoint. You're going to do that. That's what true brothers and true sisters in the Lord, that's what we do. And sometimes that's what, that's what it takes. As I close, for those who have been hurt by the people of God, by the church, because they did something or said something that was offensive or insensitive, Remember this, Jesus was insulted too. He was ridiculed too. I mean, he was abandoned by his closest friends. He was betrayed by someone who's supposed to be his helper. And I say this not to minimize your hurt. Hurt is real. And the last thing I want to do is minimize your hurt. But this is to say that Jesus sympathizes with you. Before you was insulted, he was. Before you was offended, he was. Before you was betrayed, he was. That person who has offended you may never come around. Let's be real. They may never ever come around to understand, to apologize, or to get it. But Jesus does come to him, seek his face, be made new. Psalms 55 verse 22, it says, cast your burdens on the Lord and he will sustain you. Let's pray together.
Father in heaven, we humbly come before you in the name of your precious Son. And it's only through your Son we're able to come to you. And we have dived into a sensitive topic, a difficult thing, but something that we need to hear, especially in times like today, where there's just so many opinions, so many distinct views, and we are devouring each other as brothers and sisters. We see that everywhere. Lord, forgive us. Our prayer this morning, oh God, is that you may help us as the body to treasure, to cherish each and every one, each and every member of the body, especially when they hold to different viewpoints. Help us to love them, help us to get along, help us to unite together, and help us to make the kingdom, the kingdom of God in his message, the fuel of our activity, of our motive. May that be the heartbeat of the church. So Lord, forgive us for when we are offensive to those made in the image of God, forgive us. Help us to reconcile. And I know there's many here in this church or maybe listening in the church parking lot or via Facebook Live. They, they need, they're being convicted and they know they need to apologize and they're struggling and it's hard, they don't know what to say. I pray that you may help them. Just help them, Lord. Uplift them, lead them, and guide them. Guide their words. Remind them, Lord, that the person's, you don't look at the person's response, how they respond to it, but you're looking at the motive of their heart and their intentions. I pray for those who have been offended by words said by those who are supposed to love them. I pray, oh God, for them that you may grant them the comfort of your word, the encouragement of your word. Remind them that you sympathize with them. So please help them, oh God. Bless us now. Continue to direct us in your ways and help us as a body to live for your glory and to delight in you forever. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please stand. Our invitation is turn your eyes upon Jesus. Thank mm -hmm. you.